Look away unto Jesus and say, Lord, because you have died on that cross, I am capable of receiving everything that cross has purchased for me. And sometimes God speaks over us and we're not willing to listen to wisdom. All of this is available to us through all of this good, awesome kingdom Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm going to be in Second, King, Second Kings chapter 2, if you've got your Bibles. And I'm going to pick it up in verse 9. Um, I'll, I'll give you some context after we, after we kind of read the, the, main, the main verse that I want to get to. But this is 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 9, and this is about Elijah and Elisha, and it's right before Elijah um, leaves, leaves earth in a whirlwind. So, when they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You have asked a difficult thing, Elijah said. Now, you've got to understand, contextually, Elijah was the man. Like, this, this is the man of God of the hour. This is, this, the whole nation of Israel was in turmoil. Um, King Ahab had married Queen Jezebel, and Jezebel was a worshiper of Baal or Baal or however you say that name. And every, prophets are being killed, covenants are being broken, false worship, idolatry, everything that can go wrong for a theocracy, it, it's, it's being turned upside down. And Elijah is basically, he's been kind of manning the ship by himself for periods of time while he's been facing this opposition. And actually, just a few chapters prior, um, which would be in First, First Kings, I think it was chapter 19, uh, Elijah just basically slaughtered all of the prophets of Baal. Am I saying that right? Baal, Baal. I'm, I'm just going to say it, and you'll know what I mean. <laughs> so he just, he just, he followed the direction of the Lord, and through a supernatural set of circumstances, he ends up slaughtering all of these followers of, of Baal. And when Jezebel, when Queen Jezebel finds out about that, she is absolutely irate. She's like, by this time tomorrow, by this time tomorrow, may you be among those prophets with the same fate. And like, so she sent all of her resources and men and everything after Elijah, and now he's in hiding, he's on the run, and He's basically off in a mountain somewhere, off in a cave somewhere, a couple different hiding places, and he's praying to God. He's like, all right, God, I'm alone. Why don't you just take me home now? Like, why don't you just, I'm done here. Like, the, the covenant's been broken. I, I, I did what you wanted me to do. They're, I'm on the run. They're going to kill me. Why don't you just take me? And, like, God doesn't let him die. God doesn't let him give in to that. And so he, he ends up strengthening Elijah and giving him new instructions and telling him where to go. And that's actually where um, he links up with Elisha. And God, God, you know, prophetically instructs him to basically impart his mantle to Elijah and raise him up as his replacement. And it doesn't say that explicitly, but if you, if you look kind of backwards, understanding what, what happens in fullness, that, that's, that's what God's doing at that point. And so now we're fast forwarding to our, our, our present scripture in Second Kings chapter 2, and basically we have this situation where Two very prophetic men who, who are seeing into, into the spirit realm, seeing into the, you know, getting glimpses into the will of God and into the purposes of God at a very, very high level, especially, especially high level for the Old Testament. And they basically, they both know that this is the end of Elijah's earthly ministry. They know he's, he's going. And so this question that he says, like, hey, what do you want from me? And then Elijah, his, his servant, his follower, says, I want a double portion of your spirit. It was a big deal. It was a big deal. Like, Elijah was one of the most powerful prophets of the Old Testament. When we look at John the Baptist, um, who Jesus proclaimed to be the greatest of all prophets among men, 
it, it, the scriptures say that, look, John the Baptist was moving in the power and the spirit of Elijah. So, like, that's, that's the level, that's the magnitude, that's the caliber of, of ministry and gifting and calling that we're dealing with. So, when Elijah's asking for something double that, it's not a small request. It's not a, it's not a trivial thing. So, jumping back to verse 10, you have asked a difficult thing, Elijah said, yet... If you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise not. So he basically gives him this ultimatum and says, this, it's either going to happen or it isn't based off of your action. And, what you, and it sounds like this weird, like this almost silly thing for him to have to do. But Elijah tells Elisha, you need to witness me go. You need to actually observe and perceive me leave the earthly realm and if you can do that, you'll be granted this double portion of my spirit, of my anointing, of my, you know, whatever, however you want to describe it. Verse 11, as they were walking along and talking together, suddenly, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elijah saw this and cried out, my father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elijah saw him no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them apart. He picked up the cloak that had fallen from Elijah, the mantle, and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the cloak that had fallen from him and struck the water with it. Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah, he asked. When he struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left, and he crossed over on dry land. So, let's... Let's paint this picture maybe a little bit more clearly than, than uh, me just reading the verses without the full context. What we have here is a, what I'll call a very interesting example of a universal spiritual principle. And so the, the example is Elisha, in order to get the greater anointing and the greater measure of what God has for you, you need to exhibit a capacity and ability to remain fixed and focused on the, the bullseye, on the calling of God, even when something magnificently distracting occurs. And so to me, this is, this is very interesting because this service, I just heard, what, eight, nine, ten miracles, miracle, miracle, cancer's healed, insomnia is healed, foots are being healed, like, there's all these miracles happening in our midst, and it's like, oh, that's awesome, and we ought to give testi testimony to that, and we ought to praise God to that, and we ought to get excited about that and glorify what the Lord is doing, and we, that's, that's definitely part of the kingdom equation of when, when we have, have these healings and signs and wonders occur. But what the trick is, the trick is, even when awesome, glorious manifestations of the kingdom are transpiring in our midst, we still have to stay focused on the central purpose and calling. And that's, that's what I'm building towards here. Um, I guess I'm not going to read that much of this. I'm probably going to summarize a, a little bit. But at the beginning of the chapter, this, this chapter 2 of 2 Kings, um, it, it, it just opens up and it says, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elijah were on their, their way from Gilgal, uh, Gilgal. Elijah said to Elijah, stay here. The Lord has, has sent me to Bethel. But Elijah said, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went to Bethel. And so this happens, this little interaction happens like three times. Different places, they go to Bethel, they go to the Jordan, they go to various places, various significant locations within Israel. And each time, Elijah tells Elijah, hey, leave me alone. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go off to this next place God's calling me to go to, and you got to leave me alone. And each time they visit a new locale, they're greeted by a, like, prophetic guild of people like they, they call them the sons of prophets and these sons of prophets each time they tell Elijah hey 
don't you know that your master is going to go away from you now? And so I'll read one example, because that happens three times too. Um, yeah, verse 3. The company of the prophets at Bethel came out to Elijah and asked, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, Elijah replied, but do not speak of it. And so, like, each time, Elijah, Elisha, had to remain fixated on his primary directive of getting an impartation from this man of God. And it's, it's really, it it's almost seems backwards, because what's happening is the man of God himself is saying, leave me alone. The man of God himself is saying, I'm going here. You can please just stay here. Like, I, it's, it's this weird, really funny, weird thing. But you've got, you've got to remember where Elijah is coming from. Elijah is coming from, like, a few chapters back. He's praying to God, take me home, I'm done. And so Elijah's attitude was like, I just, I want to just move on. I'm done here. And Elijah's saying, uh-uh, God assigned me to you. And the key to all this, I, maybe I'm, I'm skipping ahead too much, but I guess I just want to come out with it. The key to all of this, what everything I'm saying here, it's all about your ability to stay focused on the relationship. Everything is birthed out of the relationship. And that, that's why Elijah, Elisha is successful. You have asked a hard thing. You've asked a difficult thing. But if you do this, if, if you're able to witness me go, then it shall be granted to you. The entire thing hinges on Elisha staying devoted to Elijah relationally. The entire thing hinges on him staying fixated on that connection, that, that, that mentoring discipleship relationship. And so if we, if we go back to where, where the, the Elijah actually goes up in a, a whirlwind, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. So this is like, this is difficult to imagine how, how much of a challenge is placed on Elijah. Elijah, This is difficult. You're walking along with the man of God, you're walking along with the prophet, and you know your job is to basically watch him get caught up into heaven, to, 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 to you know, get pulled out of the earthly realm into the sky. And so you know that's, that's your job. And as you're walking along, mind your own business, just focusing on that, things made of fire appear and separate the two of you. So now he's not even next to his master anymore. He's not next to Elijah anymore. He's now got this horse fire thing and this chariot fire thing right in the middle separating the two of them. And it's like, how do you not notice that? How do you not focus on that and only that? Because what in the world is happening right now? Like, this is insane. Somebody just got healed. This is insane. I don't have insomnia anymore. How do I not focus on just that? And it's, it's, what's really, really interesting is the response of Elijah because he says, it's, it says, um, separated the two of them and Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elijah saw this. So he saw him go up in, into the whirlwind in heaven and then said, he cried out, my father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And so it's really interesting because Elijah didn't ignore the chariots. He didn't ignore the fact that something crazy and supernatural and insane just happened. But he still acknowledged it out of his relationship to Elijah. He said, my father, my father, did you see that, basically? And so it's, did you see that I just got healed of insomnia? That, that's like he, he, it's directed towards the one that he's receiving the impartation from. He doesn't just make it about the chariots of fire and the horse of fire. He's, he's, it's connected to the relationship that he has with Elijah. And so that's, that's what I'm, 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 I'm calling us to, I guess, with, with these scriptures. It's, it's not that we're not supposed to be excited. That's too many negatives. There's nothing wrong with being excited about the supernatural and the manifestations. We're, we're, we're supposed to do that. That's part, that's part of the... Of, of the, the, the principles of the kingdom is, is to give testimony and to glorify God. But we always have to do so 
in accordance and in, in respect to our relationship with God, with Christ, with the Father. And so every, everything's got to be centered on that. Otherwise, otherwise, you end up actually jipping yourself of the greater measure. And the re- it's, not, it's not that God is looking to withhold. It's actually, it's, it's a matter of practicality for him. He wants to make sure that those that are entrusted with the greatest measures and portions of these things are going to use them properly and be good stewards of them. And he knows that the way to ensure that is tr- entrusting those that are relationally devoted and committed to him. And so that's, that's the whole principle here. And actually, um, this, is, this is another funny, I guess, happenstance about this. Um, this whole revelation that I'm speaking about, I actually got this from Steve Smith. I, I don't know how many years ago you, you preached a message that I, I think your, your, your conclusion w- was a different emphasis, but it's the same exact revelation. Like, I, I got this. We were in the bread store on Harry L. Drive, and Steve Smith taught on this whole passage here. And I, I was praying earlier today about what, what God wanted me to speak about. And he brought this up to me, and I'm like, this is going to be so weird. Because, like, Steve's going to be sitting there and watching me, like, minister, like, this. Th- but, Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Um Yeah, so I think I think what I want to do now too is I, I guess I want to build this point with other other concepts in the Bible, other scriptures. But so I'm I'm probably going to quote a lot and not go to a lot cuz I I want to cover a lot of ground. If you look in the book of Acts in chapter 8, there's the account of Simon the sorcerer and he, he's this guy who's he's moving in the supernatural through spiritual channels outside of Christ to start with. And he's impressing those around him, and he gains this reputation, and he ends up receiving Christ. And he ends up starting to, you know, build up his relationship and his understanding in, in the kingdom of God proper, and starting to, you know, delve into the, 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 the reality of the kingdom of the sun. And so he sees um, Peter pray for these people, these unbelievers that receive Christ, and then he lays hands on them and they receive the baptism of the Holy Holy Spirit. And Simon the sorcerer watches this happen. And his response is, let me get my wallet out and let me give Peter money. And I'm going to, Peter, I've got 50 bucks right now if, if, you, if you teach me how to do that, this 50 bucks is yours. And like that, that was like, that was his thought process. He's like, that manifestation was awesome. And I want, I want that trick, basically. I want that magic trick. And so Peter is like, there's, there's no room for error here on, with, with you know, Peter's response. He's like, your heart is wrong before God. Lay your money perish with you. And, you know, he prophesies this whole thing. And then Simon's like, um, could you please pray for me that, I, that none of this happens and, like, I get restored and repent unto the... And, like, he changes his tune very quickly because Peter is like, no, like, that's not going to happen. It's, it's a similar concept, maybe a more exaggerated version of it. Um, but the idea is the, the same. But the manifestation... It can't be the end game. It can't, it can't be, that, that, that's not the prize. That's part of the journey. That's, part, that's, that's, that's the, you know, the blessing and the benefit of being in God. That's part of the inheritance, but it's, it's not. The main deal is us having an awesome, loving, intimate relationship with the creator. And so it's, Another thing from, from the New Testament to try to round this out. There's this picture of husband and wife. And in that picture, Paul simultaneously, I'm, I'm going from 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I'm not going to go there. I'm just going to quote. But he instructs, he instructs how 
mar a married couple needs to uh, treat one another. And he, he goes into all this stuff. But in, then even like with intimacy, he says, hey, do not deprive each other except for a time if you're devoted to, to prayer and by mutual consent. And, you, you know, your body's not your own. It's, it's your, your spouse also owns your body and, and fulfill your marital duty. And there's, there's this whole intimacy teaching there. And it's, it's very interesting because then later, or in, the, in Ephesians 5, elsewhere, he also says, look, this whole husband and wife dynamic, the whole thing, the, the, the loving, loving, uh, her, loving your wife as Christ loved the church, submitting to, to the husband as, as Christ is the head of the church, all of it, all of it, I speak a mystery to you, but I'm talking about this whole marriage thing is an example, a picture, uh, an illustration of Christ and his bride, the church. And so it's not an accident that if you look at society, a huge portion of society spends a huge amount of effort, energy, emotion, and thought, thinking, investing in romance, sex, sexuality, relationships, who, and it doesn't matter, Christian, non-Christian, worldly, unbeliever, believer. It, I mean, the prophet Andre, he's like, yeah, when people ask me for, for a prophetic word, they're basically asking me, who am I going to marry? Who am I going to be with? What's my ministry? And will I have a lot of money? Like, like, he's like, I, he's like I, I've done this you know, thousands of times. That's what it boils down to. They, people want to know who they're going to marry. People want to know who they're going to be with. People want to know, is this the right one? Is, is this, is this the, you know, God's chosen person for me? And the prevalency of, of ro romance and sexuality in society, that, that being such a big deal for so many people, that's not an accident. That's actually born out of a design from God. And so he's actually made a natural image, a natural picture of a spiritual concept where he's saying, look, I want that relationship with you. I want that intimacy with you. I want that covenant with you. I don't want to be deprived. I don't want to be, I don't, I don't want to feel, feel like I, I don't have access to you. And so it, the other thing, the other side of that coin is, where does Satan invest a huge amount of his demonic resources into, into uh, perverting? It's, I mean, you, you can look at any, any grocery store, any, it's the magazine covers, the TV shows, the movies, the music, it's all from that beat of, I want to try to dislodge the design of God in this area and cause people to go astray and, and lose focus on a singular man and woman relationship. And it doesn't matter what version of, but some form of deviation from that. And it's, it's all about that. And it doesn't matter whether you're you're currently married, have been married, or have not yet been married. The attack is still the attack, and it's still in that arena. And he just might come at you from a slightly different angle based off of what, what your, your, your current situation or circumstance is. The point is, Satan is going to try to take this thing, this relational, romantic, intimate design that God's given us our natural, physical picture of, that's reflective of, of our relationship with him, and he wants to distort it, he wants to pollute it, he wants to twist it. And so the reason why Satan's so hung up on that is because he sees the spiritual implications. He's, he's, looking, at, he's looking at it from 20,000 feet, and he's like, I don't, he doesn't care about sex. He cares about ruining your capacity to be intimate with God. That's, that's, what the ulti that's his end game. And so the reason... The reason why this is such a focal point is because you can look, you can look at a godly version of, of intimacy and romance and relationships. You can look at, of a, at a godly version of that, and you have a wonderful, awesome, very comprehensive picture of what God wants from us with our relationship with him. It's the, the whole thing. And you, you, you can... I'm, I'm not going to go too far down this road for obvious reasons, but just, just to give you enough to, like, I guess, create a level of understanding of what I mean. You don't just jump in and say, okay, boom, let's have full-fledged intimate moments with, with another person. There's usually 
a progression. And there's usually like affection and there, there's time spent and time invested. And there's, there's usually um, like, a, a, like a, a building and development of the relationship to get to that point. And if you skip that process, you're not actually getting what was the intended design. You're getting some counterfeit or some other version of it. And so it's the same exact thing with God. Like, yeah, you can have moments where you're just in the zone and you touch God and it's, 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 it's awesome and you, you get there really. But honestly, the more you build a pattern of like, well, I'm in relationship with God all the time and I'm going to be in prayer all the time. And it's, it's, not, it's not about me touching God so that I'm empowered for a specific ministerial moment. If you look at, I guess like, if you look at Jesus, he didn't really minister, he didn't, his ministry came from his relationship, not vice versa. And so the trap, another trap of the enemy in this same area is he, he tries to entangle the Christian, the believer, who's faithful and diligent and wants to build the house of God and operate in the kingdom. He tricks that believer into basically making it so that their connection with God and their, intimate, their intimacy with God is born out of a desire to minister and not born out of a desire to just be with God. And so it's, he, just, he just turns it just a little bit, and then all of a sudden you're backwards. And now... Now you're, you're operating in half measure. Now you can't get the double portion because you've taken your focus off of the primary goal of being in relationship with God and you've sidestepped it and deviated just a little bit maybe. And it's, there's nothing wrong with pursuing God for the purpose of ministry. Like we, we went, we, we fasted, we prayed, and we prepared for the miracle pool. And that was a good, godly, wise thing to do. The point is this though, if the only time that you're going to devote yourself and commit yourself to God is because, oh, well, there's a miracle pool. There's something off kilter then. There's something imbalanced. And it, it means that, it doesn't mean that God doesn't love you and you don't love God and that you're not in a, a, a healthy, good relationship with him in a lot of ways. But what it does mean is you've inadvertently gypped yourself of the greater measure. You've inadvertently incapacitated yourself. You've stunted your ability to tap into the greater manifestations and the deeper things of God because you're, you're making it only about a ministerial event and not about a true, legitimate relationship with the Lord. If you watch Jesus, very few times in his ministry, very, very, very few times can you equate, oh, well, Jesus prayed and he was praying specifically in preparation for some sort of ministerial event. You could argue, okay, he stayed up all night praying the night before he called the 12 disciples. And the night before he was crucified, he stayed up all night and prayed and was talking to God specifically about that event. So it's not that, that's not an illegal thing to do by any means. It's a perfectly reasonable and wise thing to do. But if you watch Jesus, the pattern is actually the opposite. So many times he would go and minister and he'd heal all these people and he'd do all this awesome stuff. And then after he was done ministering, he would withdraw to a quiet place and pray. And like we, we do the exact opposite of that. We withdraw to a quiet place and pray. Then we, pr we, we, we preach or we minister or we do whatever we're going to do. And then we're like, all right, we'll turn the TV on. We're done. And so it, there's nothing wrong with taking a rest or watching. I'm not trying. Don't hear, mishear me. I'm just saying the emphasis, if you watch the pattern of Christ, if you look, if you look at how he, how he operated, the emphasis was always on his relationship with the Father. And his ministry would come out of that relationship. He wasn't, he wasn't building the relationship for the purpose of the ministry. It was, it was the opposite. So yeah, this is, um, this is a message that I would probably not have chosen to give, to be honest. I, wouldn't, I, 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 didn't, I didn't like set out to do this. This is a message that I, I think, though, it's more a, one of sobriety. It's, it's one that I think where we're headed and what we're doing and what we're already achieving, this has to be a factor. This has to be a consideration. Otherwise, we're not going to, we're, we're going to jip ourselves ultimately and jip, jip those around us. But I'm going to turn it back over to Pastor Keith, and he's going to close us.
God's awesome. You know, and if we don't, as Tim's saying, it's like it's that relationship. It starts when you wake up in the morning, and then it's throughout the day. And then when you go to sleep, those last thoughts, those last conversations are with the Lord. And then you know what? Then you dream. And God sh- speaks things to you in your dreams. It's like it's just continuous. And with, if, if we allow those breaks in between, then we're missing out on what God has for us. We don't want to do that. You know, let it flow in our ministry, in our lives, in our relationships. The relationship we have with God, everything else will flow greatly through that. You can rise to your feet. We're gonna-